So I'm on a roll and I'm going to make another video and this is again on salts but it's this time on insoluble versus soluble salts. Depending on what exam board you're studying, um, you will need to know this or you won't. I'm really aiming this at the IGCSE candidates. This is horrible because it literally is just rote learning. You have got to learn this enormous grid and work out basically which salts are soluble and which ones are insoluble. Now I teach lots, lots of different people and some people like to learn the grid, um, which I just couldn't do because there's so many things in there and other people just like to learn the rules which is much more what I would do and then you can deduce afterwards which salts are soluble or insoluble. So I'm going to obviously show you the grid which is here. Now don't panic, I know there's a lot on there but it is easy if you know how and there's just a few rules you need to learn. Firstly, all ammonium, sodium, potassium compounds are soluble. So it doesn't matter what else is in the name of the salt, if you see one of those three words, ammonium, potassium, sodium, it's soluble. Secondly, all nitrates are soluble. Same thing, if you see the word nitrate, it's soluble. Then it gets slightly tricky and we look at the chlorides. Now most of the chlorides are soluble, but you're going to have to learn some exceptions. And those are silver chloride and lead 2 chloride. So if you see either of those compounds, it's insoluble. Then we have the sulfates, again these are all soluble with a couple of exceptions and again it's lead to sulfate and this time we've got barium sulfate and calcium sulfate, both of these are insoluble. Now we flip and we say that the next set of compounds are insoluble and they are the carbonates. So all carbonates are insoluble but there are exceptions to that and they're the first things we talked about, that's ammonium, sodium, potassium, carbonates are soluble. Okay, so Disregard carbonate when you see it, as long if it has ammonium, potassium, sodium in it, then it is a soluble carbonate, everything else insoluble. And then lastly, we've got the hydroxides, and these are all insoluble with exceptions, and you've guessed what those will be, they'll be the ammonium, sodium and potassium hydroxides, they will all be soluble. I hope I didn't make any mistakes there, it's really hard to like talk about these things on camera because you're just constantly running them through your head to work out if it's making sense and I hate it when I go back to edit and I realise I made a glaring mistake because I really hate refilming stuff more than anything. Anyway, next up you need to know how to make these salts and that is really unpleasant. It's probably my least favourite thing that I teach to my tutees and my students. However, they have to do it, you have to do it, therefore I'm going to have to do it. First of all, we need to work out if our salt is soluble or insoluble based on what I was just talking about. Now there are three methods you need to know about. Firstly, the insoluble salts method, and this is the most straightforward method, and it's the precipitation method, and this precipitate is just a solid which forms in a solution. So, what you have to do here, because you're producing a insoluble salt, actually I think I'm just going to run through some crucial keywords to make sure you're happy with those. First of all, soluble means something dissolved, insoluble means something doesn't dissolve, a solute is the solid which gets dissolved, the solvent is the liquid in which the solute dissolves. The solution is a mixture of the solute and the solvent. And a saturated solution is just something which can't dissolve any more solute in it. Anyway, that was a little side note to just to help you with any keywords that you're struggling with. So going back to our first method, which is the method we use to produce insoluble salts, and we're going to use the precipitation method. I'm going to run through the overview on how you do this and then I'm going to provide a brief summary which is actually the only bit that you'll need to include in your exam and luckily it's really short and easy to remember. So because you're making an insoluble salt, one which doesn't dissolve, what you're going to do is you're going to react your two solutions together and you're going to produce an insoluble salt. Now you need to get that insoluble salt out of the solution, so what do you use that? Use the simple filtration method. So you're going to get a filter funnel, you're going to add filter paper, you're going to place it over a beaker and you're going to pour your solution through that contains your salt. Because the salt's insoluble, it will stick to the filter paper while the rest of the solution will drain through into the beaker and you'll be left with your wet crystals, your wet salt basically sat in your filter paper. So what you need to do then, you need to allow it to, you, first of all you need to wash it to remove the excess solution and then you need to allow the whole thing to dry and therefore you'll be left with your insoluble salt. So the summary, so this is the only thing you need to write in the exam, even though the question we worth four or five marks is react, filter, wash, dry and I promise you only need to mention those few words. You can add a few extra details to make your answer look more sensible but really in essence what you need to say is that you need to react your solutions together you need to filter, you need to wash off the excess solution, and you need to dry the crystals. And that's it, done. So remember, those are the insoluble salts, so that will be most of the carbonates, most of the hydroxides, 
the few exceptions like the silver chlorides and the lead 2 chlorides and the lead 2 sulfates etc. Okay, now we get more complicated and we start looking at soluble salts and there are two methods you need to know and it, which method you choose depends on whether you're talking about the ammonium, potassium or sodium salts or the rest. So we're going to talk about the rest. So this is any soluble salt which does not contain ammonium, sodium or potassium. So what you need to do this time is really similar. So you need to react your solutions together. You need to filter, but crucially, because the salts produced are soluble, you're not going to get that salt left behind in the filter paper. It's going to drain through. So you're going to use the filtering method to remove the excess solid. But then you're going to be left with your solution, your salt solution in the beaker. So at this point, you need to evaporate off the excess liquid. So what you're going to do is pop that solution in an evaporating basin over a gauze on top of a tripod with a Bunsen burner sitting on a heatproof mat underneath and you're going to use the heat from the Bunsen burner to evaporate off that excess liquid and you're going to be left with the salt. So your summary here is react, filter, evaporate, cool, dry. So remember you're going to react, filter, evaporate, cool and dry. You're evaporating to remove that excess liquid, you're cooling because you need to let the whole thing cool down and it's going to dry and remove all that excess liquid, the last bits of liquid left on your salt. And that's it, done. Really similar to the first method, the precipitation method, but just with that added step of using the evaporating basin to remove that excess water. Your third and final method is for soluble salts which do contain potassium, ammonium and sodium and this is the most complicated method. You can't just react the metal with the acid and expect the salt to form because remember things like potassium and sodium are unbelievably reactive, unbelievably reactive. They're in group one. They react with the moisture in your hands. You can't go adding them to acid because you'll end up with an explosion. So you're not allowed to use that method. Equally, you can't just react them together because what happens is the product produced is so soluble that it just dissolves away again and you're left with nothing. So you, you just can't use that method. What you need to do is use a method whereby you know the exact amount of acid and alkali that you need to add in order to make the salt. And you don't want to add any more you don't want to add any excess of either because, like I said, the product will continue to dissolve away. So, what is the method we use to decide the exact amounts? Well, it's the titration method. And you're probably best, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Googling, YouTubing a video on titration to understand what's going on. But in essence, what you have is a conical flask that contains an exact amount of either acid or alkali. In my example, I'm going to say it contains acid. And you're going to have used a pipette to accurately measure out that acid to the nearest literally the nearest drop. So you know exactly the amount of acid in your conical flask. In your burette, which is a very tall glass cylinder, that's going to contain your alkali. And what you need to know is the amount of alkali that needs to be added to the acid to get neutralization. So you're going to need an indicator, and there's lots of different indicators, things like phenolthylene, methyl orange. I'm going to use phenolthylene. So I'm going to add a few drops of indicator to my acid in my conical flask. And what you will find is it will be colorless. And then you turn the tap on the burette and you start adding the alkali. And at an exact point, what you will find is that the colour will change in that conical flask from that colourless solution to this brilliant pink. It's a stunning um, colour. It's probably my favourite colour in chemistry. And that's the exact moment, the exact volume, at which that solution has been neutralised. And you'll be able to record the amount of alkali that you added. After that... Because you now know the exact volumes of both the acid and alkali, you know the exact volumes you need to produce your salt. So you're just going to repeat that experiment, but without your indicator, because obviously your indicator screws things up a bit, and you're only using that as a marker anyway. But let's just summarise quickly what you're going to do. You're going to react to your two solutions together. You're going to add an indicator so you know the exact amounts you need to add. Then you're going to repeat the whole thing again, but without the indicator, because you've worked out the exact volumes that you need. Then you're going to evaporate, because remember it's soluble, so you're not going to be able to filter that properly. So you're going to evaporate it to remove the excess liquid, and then you're going to cool and dry it. So it's like a mixture of the previous two methods for making salt. I'm going to give you a summary now, which is the minimal amount of things you need to learn. So you're going to react, you're going to use indicator, you're going to repeat the experiment without the indicator, you're going to evaporate, and you're going to cool and dry that was really hard, that video. I found it really difficult to film because it's really complicated and it is a really difficult topic. Um, and only if you're really aiming for your A-stars would I even worry about learning it because it is a real pain to learn, in all honesty. I found this video really hard to film. However, 
I hope you found it helpful. As always, leave me any questions, um, any comments, like my Facebook page, Science with Hazel, and I'll get back to you with any answers to questions that you may have. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.